the ultimate all-in-one electric home brewing system is here. The new Grainfather G40 can produce up to 11 gallons of beer and features all the latest advancements in home brewing technology, including wireless control so you can monitor your brew day from the Grainfather app. With an innovative new grain basket design that improves workflow, reaching mash efficiencies of 75% or more is easy. The 3300-watt heating element brings your wort to a boil quickly without any scorching, and the large hot plate filter guarantees that no unwanted grain matter or hop chub reaches your fermenter. Every G40 comes standard with a high-powered built-in pump that can handle temperatures over 200 degrees Fahrenheit and a full three-year warranty that guarantees you'll be able to keep on brewing no matter what. The Grainfather G40 is available now at your favorite homebrew retailer or online at grainfather.com. Today's show is brought to you by Imperial Yeast. You hear us gushing over Imperial Yeast all the time, and that's because their yeast performs for us in every batch that we brew. Imperial Yeast is adored by commercial breweries and home brewers alike. Their pitch right pouches are jam-packed with over 200 billion fresh yeast cells guaranteed to deliver flawless, fast fermentations every time. Imperial yeast strains are grown by a team of pro brewers and home brewers who live to help other brewers learn more and ferment better. Join any recipe receiving tier of our Trub Club and get a free upgrade to premium Imperial yeast with every recipe kit that ships out to you. Learn more at homebrewhappyhour.com forward slash club and come brew with us. Entertaining shows with content that spreads information and sparks discourse throughout the community. This is the Pearl Media Network. Serving temps for different styles of beer, different solutions for bottling from the keg, cleaning a jockey box plate chiller, and do I need to let the crowds in fall? Before transferring my beer. This is Homebrew Happy Hour, episode 275. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Homebrew Happy Hour. This is the show where we supply the answers to your homebrewing questions and discuss all things related to craft beer. If you have a question you'd like us to discuss on a future episode, go to homebrewhappyhour.com and click on that submit a question link at the top of the page or earn a $25 gift card if you call and leave a voicemail at 325-305-6107. I'm your host, Joshua Stu, and today I'm joined by the Director of Operations at cmbecker.com down there, Mr. James Carlson, as well as the President and Chief Keg Washer of kegconnection.com. Is that the same blue shirt you wore last year for Skipper? I can't tell. Mr. Todd Burns, it's not. It's slightly different, right? I don't think it was last year. Or last show. I said last episode, didn't I? I don't think I said last uh, episode. I said last year, Did I think. I last year? I thought I said last year. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what I said. I don't know what I had for breakfast. Um, my, You know, my pop actually said, you pull off Skipper better without the hat. Because the hat, I've never heard this said about you, but my dad goes, the hat was too big for him. Have you, I don't think I've ever... <laughs> I've never seen a hat too big for Todd Burns. Oh, you kept it in there. There, there you go. See, I think, well, I went. Oh, it looked to me like it. Was, the hat was too small. That's why oh. I was making the Ra- Michael uh, reference. Yeah, when you, the yeah, booze oh, okay. cruise. <laughs> I know you're just going to wear this every in. show now. I, I almost, you know what? I have my yeah, I have my skipper hat, but it would take away from my. Except hat. I'm going to wear mine uh, more cool like. I'm going to wear it backwards. <laughs> yeah. Oh, like no, it looks like a Frenchman. Michael. It is date night, Michael. You're right. Hi, date. I'm date Mike. Nice to meet you. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh my gosh! I gotta tell y'all before we get going into small talk, relevant small talk. I had the weirdest uh, feedback email recently. Someone told me, Josh, I'm not. I haven't left a, a bad review, but I'm about to. If y'all don't stop with the ads in your show, I'm not convinced they listen to our show because they're like saying. Y'all play too many ads in the middle of the show and this and that. And I wrote him back like, I think you're talking about a different podcast, man. We play. Yeah, we don't have any ads. We have in the no middle. ads in the middle of the yeah. show. No. What awkward. You, it was super awkward. It's kind of like, uh, Todd, we get this sometimes where there, there's another retailer who has the plural domain for Keg Connection. And it goes to them. And sometimes people will email us all pissed off about a messed up order. And you're like, well, what's your order number? And they start throwing numbers and stuff where it's like, what are letters and, 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 and special symbols? And we're like, whoa, whoa, no, wait. 
What what is your order number? Oh no, that wasn't us. Yes, it is because I went to kegconnections.com. Like, yeah. <laughs> See, when Todd bought domains in 1997, he forgot to buy <laughs> the plural form, so it was it wasn't really a thing. Like you didn't you didn't think about. It. We did get the .net though, but no one ever mistakenly goes to the .net. They, so just your your reminder that uh, oh no, what just happened on the oh there we go. Whew, my my screen went blank. Uh, it's Ted Connection singular not plural (laughs) anyways we do have some small talk let me start with trub club stuff because it is april 2022 already the year is flying i think we say that every month but the year is flying and for this month recipe receiving members of our trub club tier will get let me put it on screen don't say anything todd because you can't see it anyway todd's barn beer and look at that picture I, i used the todd peering through a refractometer photo for the cover art and I don't know if I made a mistake on this photo, Todd, because I put on there that it comes with Imperial Independence because I thought that's what you said, but I don't remember which one you used. No, it wasn't Independence. Shiza. Okay. Well, I'll change the artwork. It, it, it was, was it Flatship? I don't I remember. I don't remember, but I'm sure I didn't use that one. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, uh, it should be on the recipe. Did you I, look at the recipe? I, yeah, I left it there in my office uh, at headquarters. But I'm going to be there all next week, so I'll get it right soon, and you can correct me at some point when you pull it up. Yeah, I'll look at uh, Brewer's Friend to try to find what I put Yeah, and and, and we haven't put in the order yet for uh, with Imperial, so I haven't made that big a mistake. Just that this artwork is is not going to be right. And I'll update it. But yes, you get, if you, again, if you're in the top tier, you get Todd's Barn Beer sent to you. Let me tell you, I think James would agree, it was delicious. James mm-hmm. called it the text your ex-girlfriend beer i think <laughs> yeah, yeah we're gonna try to uh we're gonna try to make it not quite that strong right <laughs> yeah that's on you man yeah james when we were putting it together last week james goes do you, you want to lower the abv a little <laughs> like, <laughs> just to just to touch because what it finished like, like darn near eight percent i think it was our 7.8 maybe. i don't know if i've ever mentioned it on the show but my system is very efficient. <laughs> <laughs> you never told us that. No. And then um, we do have another giveaway for the month of April, and that's going to be, boom, there it is on screen, a Saint D coupler with MFL connections and a stainless steel probe. One of the reasons we like this kind of configuration on a Saint D coupler, well, one, guys, what is it, 95% of domestic beers use Saint D? I mean, I could, I could probably say 99% of domestic beers use the Saint D coupler. <laughs> Would yep. you agree, Todd? I'm sorry. I was looking at the yeast. It's a it's a brick house. Ah, we're using Imperial House. Okay, I'll, I'll yep. I will update that uh, artwork. But on the stainless steel probed MFL Saint D coupler, the the benefit of it, like I said, is the vast majority of commercial beer you would buy in the United States that's domestic beer is going to use that kind of coupler. But my favorite part is those MFL connections. Because if you have swivel nuts on your lines, swapping between your your homebrewed connections like ball lock or pin lock and this uh, uh, Saint TD coupler, it, it, it's seconds, right? It, it takes. Oh, it's the way to do it. When I did that wedding uh, last weekend, that's exactly what I did. I set it up with that because I, there was some confusion on it. So I was glad I did because I found out. Uh, I won't mention any names like Wes. But uh, he told me that they were all going to be in Sankey kegs, and then they were, I mean, they were all going to be in uh, corny kegs, and they were in Sankey kegs. So, no way, that's yeah, funny. but I was able to switch it around. So. F- well, and are they kegging in the little uh, Sith's barrel, or what size? Were they, they? These were full size kegs. How did he get that so wrong? <laughs> <laughs> there's a big difference come on Wes. he doesn't listen to the show he was here this morning so yeah I, I know i saw i saw a grain order come through because y'all sometimes sell grain to locals and i almost was going to call you and chastise you no i need that for the recipes this month but y'all know what y'all are doing when you're selling. none of those you're not using those you're you're using a two row right yeah or- correct yeah your your barn beer uses two row so we're good for this month uh, and we're actually good for everything. James was able to find everything we needed for that. Re- so we'll, we won't have to order again till the end of the month for the next couple months, but good, but yeah, anyway. So yes, if, if you're interested in all this, go to patreon.com forward slash homebrew happy hour. We appreciate it no matter what tier you join. And honestly, we just appreciate you tuning in, whether you give us money for the club or not. But as Todd says, you're a lot cooler when you join the Chub club. So 
um, thank you to all our members. And, and again, the giveaway is not just for top tier. That's everybody. If you're at patreon.com forward slash homebrew happy hour, read the details in each tier to learn more about uh, the giveaways, how many entries you get each month, and then if you're qualified for a recipe or not. But with all that said, I'm trying to think of other small talk. I don't have a lot except that you guys are abandoning me next week for a trip and I'm in charge at headquarters. We did a dry run or a trial run uh, la- the earlier this week. And James, it wasn't as bad as it could have went with me at the Oh, head. you did good. Yeah. No. It's, uh, I know it, it, it's been a long time since I've messed up orders, and it felt good to get back into that rhythm, Todd. I have to be honest. So Josh and Josh are running the entire operation next week, and both of them are in charge, James. So, <laughs> oh wow, <laughs> folks, look for a going out of sale business that's what I, that's what uh, for keg, uh, going out of business sale I'm, for keg I'm connection the week it. after week after next. No, next week I'm going to be like Todd's gone. Bye, bye. bye. <laughs> that's gonna what, what are those old mattress commercials? You know, where they're like, we've got to get rid of everything because we're crazy. Uh, that's what, that's what I'm going to do next week for sure. I'm going to have fire sales every day. I got to think of some way to, to, to increase sales. I've, I've tried my best. turns out I'm not that great a salesman. So I don't actually have, like I said, when y'all are gone, I was thinking about brewing on your barn setup one of the evenings, but, uh, I forget how, like if I started at like five 30. So yeah, you run the water the day before yeah, or the night before, and then. I would, uh, I would get it all heated up that morning. Yeah. And then, uh, you'll be ready to go. You could do it in six hours. Oh, well, that's what I said. Where I was going with it is I thought about brewing at the barn. Oh, then, hell no. You no, can't no. do that. You're not going to clean anything up <laughs> if you're not done till 11 o'clock at night. I, you're just going to. First gonna, off. Oh yeah. You're going to clean everything up at 11 at night. First that's off, never going to happen. First off. I'm the only one nowadays cleaning up after myself after the barn. Do you not like y- y'all had guests recently left it a mess. I picked up after them. Sort of. I picked up after myself, but secondly, if you'd let me finish, I'll just say, or maybe I could brew um, at the office on Friday when it's a little bit slower and be, I can, I can watch it there and then, you know, do uh, order fulfillment and all that and, and, and keep an eye on it. That's what I was leading to is if I brew next week or y'all are gone, it might be Friday, but y'all are actually coming back Friday or y'all are coming back Saturday. Saturday. Oh, okay. So you won't be there anyway. So I can do whatever I want. You're not going to be there. Do whatever you want. But your wife is staying back. I thought she was going with you. That's the best news of the week, actually, Todd. You're gone, but Liz is staying back and told me she'd cook for me every night. Oh, my gosh. Your best. enthusiasm makes me nervous. It's going to be the best week ever. Are you kidding me? Uh, I'm going to sit in your hot tub after eating food that was meant for you, drinking your whiskey and beer. I'm going to send you text all, all night. It's going to be great. Anyway, we do have some feedback for this week. So with that being said, it's time for listener feedback. This week's listener feedback is from our buddy, Michael. He, Michael Lagoods, the guy who's fire crew from Conroe. We took a photo of and put it on our Instagram. So he has some feedback cool. about uh, fire safety. Hey, guys. Uh, Michael Lagoods here. I just wanted to echo y'all sentiments about propane from last week's show. From a fire prevention and carbon monoxide standpoint, you definitely don't want to use it indoors unless it's properly piped from the outside. I'd also say that if you're currently storing propane cylinders indoors or in a garage, get them outside. If you have a fire, that may explode and will seriously injure or kill anybody nearby. Up until a short time ago, I always brewed using propane. I recently converted my rig to natural gas, and now it's a whole lot cheaper, more convenient, and much quieter. I highly recommend that. As you said, the vast majority of gas appliances are designed for use for propane and conversion kits are becoming almost non-existent because of the liabilities involved. Conversion is possible with some careful research and attention to detail. There's a lot of bad advice out there, such as drilling out propane orifice to uh, natural gas size. i got to stress, never, ever, ever put undue stress on your orifice. Lastly, you guys got to hurry up and drink that beer I brought you. I don't normally bottle, so I don't know how long it's going to stay fresh in there. Uh, wait much longer, you're just going to think I'm a bad brewer. I look forward to the show every week. Keep up the good work. Talk to you soon. Oh, Mike, thank you so much for the feedback. And I misspoke. We called him, or when his fire, uh, uh, whatever 
the position of that guy was who called him. I go, oh, we actually have some of your beer in Todd's beer fridge. No, we didn't. I looked for it because I was going to drink it that night. You, who knows when we consumed it? Because I didn't realize, too, he did. He had sent it at Kolsch Cup, which was over a year ago. And so we probably drank it last summer. But uh, no, we drank your beer. From what I remember, it was good. But, you, you know, to freshen our memory, you should send us some more. I think that would really help. Which does remind me, though, James, we cracked open a bottle of Brian's alt beer that he sent to the office. And I thought it was pretty good. For for not yeah. ever brewing the style and not knowing what to compare it to, he was pretty stinking close. He was better yeah, yeah. better than a lot of commercial examples of alt, in my opinion, in the states. That is, yeah, yeah, better than a lot of the ones I've brewed. Yeah, no, uh, you, you say you're you're your biggest critic though. Some of your some of the ones that you're like, oh, I didn't like it. I let you think it's not good because I'm hoping I can <laughs> take the keg. And you're like, yeah, I don't want it. But no, your your <laughs> recent alt that's on tap is phenomenal. It's uh, I, when I went up there, it's all I want to drink off of Todd's tap. And you already went through your keg of it, didn't you? Oh yeah, I'm I'm out of beer. Yeah, <laughs> I gotta lock that. I gotta lock that out before I leave. No, <laughs> don't. You're gonna. Oh my gosh, it's gonna be like I'm a teenager all over again. All the all the liquors gonna be in your safe, and all the taps are gonna be locked. Hey, listen, I know guys, and I'm supposed to be the vendor and know the answer to this, but I have a, a listener question. Can anybody does anybody know how you can lock out a corny keg? Just the whole <laughs> keg itself. If if so, if you could uh, uh, email it to me right away because I need it before listen, next week. Listen, dude, you know what you could do. You can you could disconnect all the liquid lines and just lock the actual uh, uh, lid and, and and do a padlock or something of, of the teaser, and then boom, I can't get it. All I have to do is just do something really simple that requires you to have any effort involved. <laughs> <laughs> Jay, that's what kept me from drinking all the amber and alt beer last week because he was like oh if you just reassemble the faucets and put this in the, and then determine which line goes where i was like you know what i'm drinking whiskey tonight it's okay so you're right todd that is <laughs> anything that requires a little bit of effort all right uh that was our feedback thank you michael for submitting that we do have four questions for y'all this week starting with our first question which was a text message from our buddy john using our hotline at 325-305-6107 john wrote what styles can you think of that shouldn't be served at the same temp? I'm building a four tap keys and want to prepare. John, I've never thought of this. Are there any styles, guys, that are so drastically different they shouldn't be served at the same temp? Uh, yeah, I mean, there definitely are styles that should be sure served at different temperatures. But we, I think most home brewers just completely ignore that because I mean, what are we going to do? Have three refrigerators? So we, <laughs> yeah, we that's just going serve a little them. too deep down the rabbit hole, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so we just serve them at the same, uh, the same temperature, and a lot of times we serve them at the same pressure. But you know, a really good example would be like a an English beer, like the ESB, or even more so uh, some porter stouts. A lot of times, you you really ought to probably have those carbonated to eight or nine percent. I mean, not. not percent psi, PSI yeah. and uh instead of you know serving them at like 12 and carbonating you know similar to that and by the way i, I say that a lot I, I don't really talk about volumes of co2 and all of that because i think it gets really confusing for people what i usually try to do is just say yeah i'm carbonating this to where it, when it's at eight psi that's where it's going to pretty much stay and we're going to put it at eight psi or if it's 12 psi but obviously the the real way to do that is volumes and we have some stuff on the website on that as well yep. but anyway back to my answer yeah there definitely are styles that would be served at different temperatures but i just serve everything at about 38 and if i'm if i'm serving a stout sometimes what i'll do or or another beer another english beer that was traditionally consumed a lot warmer is uh i'll i may serve it and let it just take my time with it let it sit a little while let it warm up and and, and not worry about it but i mean they're they're all i don't know they're, there's there's not much you can do on that unless you had multiple refrigerators so here's a question that popped in my head while you were saying that your, your keys are specifically you have to use mm -hmm. a thermostat controller right and to, to to keep it at that 38 yep. where, where, yep. in a, where in a keys there's the ideal spot for the probe to go so that you're as accurate to the temperature you've set on the thermostat. I put mine uh, towards the top, right? Like, so I've got eight kegs in there at any given time. I will put it in the very center of the eight kegs and, and okay. go down a little while, a little ways, but I don't go all the way down. 
So that's, that's where I will typically set mine unless I open it and don't notice that it moved. And I put it on the outside of the keyser, which doesn't work well at all. Cause it freezes all of your beers. I found that out a few weeks ago. <laughs> I remember. So. Yeah. And James, you use a keyser. I mean, a thermostat controller setup too, right? Is that how you configure it? No, I've just got a, a fridge. Oh, I'm just using a fridge. I just assume because you're going through a wall. So you, yeah. Oh yeah. So uh, yeah, I've got insulated. Uh, my beer lines are insulated where they hit the shank. So yeah, I'm going to get foam the first pour, but it doesn't. It doesn't take it very long to to start serving. Right. See, and I was decent. just saying, my my pop and I have the two turnkey kegerators like the fridges and we have you know dial thermometers in there and all we can do is is really just from one to six or whatever the day, you know, whatever the controller is that's built into the fridge and kind of dial it in that way. But Todd, you'd say for a generalized, uh, uh, temperature for serving in Fahrenheit, like 38, is that 38? Okay. Yeah. That's, that's what you're shooting for. I mean, if you're, you know, some people may, most, most refrigerators are not going to stay at 38 because, uh, you know, like with the uh, keyser, you can set how much of an offset you want so that, so basically it won't be turning off and on constantly. Cause what you don't want to do is have it turn your, your uh, condenser on and off. You just get basically boom, 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 back and forth. So I've got mine set for three degrees, which means it could go actually, I think it's three degrees total range, but I could be wrong about that. I think it'll go from 36 and a half to, uh, 39 and a half is, okay. is I think that's, a, that's what the three degrees range is a safe range. You know, yeah. James, you're talking about how different fridges at different temps is way too deep in the rabbit hole for a home brewer. Yeah. Do, I can't even think of a commercial setting though, that people do. I mean, the only well, like on a, is like a the, good example of like Todd said, the English ales, they, they may have what's called a cask ale and uh, that's low carbonation, warmer temperature. So that's one that just to re- immediately we were able to have one off of a beer engine and it was pretty in, pretty amazing uh, stuff. In DC, I think, is where we did had that, or it was Baltimore? It's one of those two cities. Yeah, I mean, it was beer, actually uh, in Heathrow Airport in London. Oh, or y'all, or don't you remember on a CBC trip? I want to say it was the one in DC. There was a bar out of a beer engine that was serving, mm-hmm. and and it was just cellar temps for that specific beer coming up through, through the beer engine. That's the first time I'd had. And, and you've got to drink it all. I mean, it's not uh, – you're, you're introducing oxygen, you know. So you with a beer engine, you you pump that beer out and you serve it that night. Yeah, uh, it was pretty cool. Which yeah. that. doesn't tend to be a problem probably in a, yeah. in a busy bar and a pub in England. So yeah. but That was the only time I've seen that. I can't think of any other bar. Like you said, it's just logistically not feasible to go, okay, we're going to have this fridge all for this style. And then out of this serving thing, we'll have just this style. And Yeah. When, you, when you're when you in England, when you go to a pub, a lot of times the, all the beers will be warmer. So maybe, you know, they kind of do that with all their beer, unless you get into some of the lighter styles. And then they'll have co- those colder. So they must have more than one fridge that they're doing that with. They must. Yeah. Or, or their cellar temps are, are decent. Cause what I'm, mean, well, I say cellar, if, if you're serving at cellar temp, what does that imply? It's in the, in the fifties Fahrenheit or in the sixties. I mean, yeah. pardon me. Yeah. I think, I think so. Right. Todd 50 mid fifties. Yeah. Probably for cellar temp. I don't, I don't know that most of them are actually in a cellar. Uh, well, they may be, but they're probably also have temperature control. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, I'd imagine, I don't know. I mean, that's a great question to ask one of our people from up north where they actually have cellars and basements because we don't have basements in our area at all. It'd be very hard to it's have a basement. extremely rare. Yeah. It says right here, cask ale draft beer at its best is best served at 55 degrees Fahrenheit. There you go. Yeah, you and know. that's that. I remember drinking a lot of those beers. And the problem is, if you super highly carbonate something and you serve it at fifty five, that you're gonna, you know, that's gonna all come out, and and you're also gonna get a lot of foam. Say, so foam if you're, yeah, so if you're serving something that warm, you definitely don't want it to be carbonated anywhere near as high. Yeah, John. Uh, to wrap up your question, man, I, for a home brewer, I would just relax and don't worry, and and, and just enjoy your home brew as Charlie would say, because you could go down that, that rabbit trail, as I've heard some people call it, uh, or you could just <laughs> relax and enjoy the process. So thank you so much for submitting that question. Reminder, if and when you call 
a voicemail, we give you a $25 gift card to KetConnection.com. But if you text or email it, we give you a 15 which is still pretty good for us a- answering your question. But you can always do that at 325-305-6107. Speaking of voicemails, our second question for this week comes from our buddy Troy from Mississippi. Hey, Todd, James, Joshua. Uh, this is Troy over here in Mississippi again. Um, quick question for you. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen it or had any experience with it, but just wanted to see. Um, I've got one. Well, it's not a Blitman beer gun, but it's a, it's a, a beer gun. Uh, I don't even remember who makes it, but so I can bottle from the keg. Um, but I saw there's a, a thing out there um, from Tap Cooler where you can bottle right off of the tap uh, from forward, forward ceiling tap. So just wondering if you guys had any experience with that, how well it works, any uh, tips or tricks with that. Um, just looking for other ways that I can, uh, well, share my beer where um, I, I don't get the dirty looks for, for brewing so often. So I can <laughs> tell my wife that I'm, I'm sharing the beer instead of drinking it all. Uh, one other note, Josh, you, you mentioned that, uh, you know, with 11 years of training in jujitsu, you think you can take your dad, but you're not willing to try. Uh, the voice of experience will tell you, uh, don't do it. Uh, dads will always take their sons, no matter how, how old they get. My father's in his 80s and uh, has a bad hip and a bad back, but I'm still afraid of the man. Um, and that's mainly because dads will always cheat in a fight. They will always win. Don't do it. Save your ego. That's my advice to you. All right. So I got Love you guys. Love. See you. That's the best. It, it reminds me of Todd has a saying or, or a philosophy about you have one minute or is it 30 seconds? In a uh, 40, I'm at 45 now. Yeah. You're 45 seconds. It used to be a minute. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so if you're, if you're an older person and maybe not in the peak of, of physical conditioning, <laughs> such as myself and pretty much everybody that I know, because we're all older now and my brother, especially, uh, the, the rule is you have to win a fight in 45 seconds because after 45 seconds, you run out of breath and you can't fight anymore. And the other person's going to beat you <laughs> to a pulp. So yeah. the problem with that is for the opponent is if somebody absolutely has to win in the first 45 seconds, they're going to do everything they can to win in the first 45 seconds. Me. It's going to be extremely violent and extremely fast i mean i'm not fast but you know what i mean it's no, going to be violent yeah, yeah the so. violence is going to be fast oh i know you've warned me when when, when, yeah. I, when i buck up you're like you know what? i'm gonna kill you i was like oh no you won't you don't know i'm gonna cheat and kill you <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah you're right about that <laughs> troy uh but about his question so yeah tap cooler has I, I don't even know how long they've been around but i have seen them kind of flooding the market and in, in the forums people are like using the, the the tap cooler as a way to bottle i had to look it up there theirs is a counter pressure bottle filler versus the beer gun which is not actually counter pressure at all so i figured we'd start the conversation because i don't actually know the difference todd why what what is counter pressure versus whatever the beer guns using and is there a preference that you have or does it not really matter Okay, so we, we do sell a counter pressure system. And what you do with a counter pressure system is you've got a tube going down to the beer, but you've also got a second tube that uh, well, you've got like a stopper and, and you put the stopper on there and, you, and, you've, and you've got uh, two tubes and one of them is, can put CO2 in and the other one puts beer in. And what you do is you, you make the pressure exactly the same in the bottle as it is in the keg. And then you start the beer flow and the beer's flowing in, but it's flowing into a pressurized bottle. That's the same pressure that it's coming from. So you get no foam. I mean, it's a, it's a really, really good way to transfer beer. You, you know, you always purge the, the bottle first with the CO2. So you don't have any oxygen in there. Uh, and, and it's a really, really good way to transfer beer. It's, it's a little slower and there's some more steps to it takes a little bit longer. The great thing about a beer gun is, you know, it's uh, it, what it does is it does it with a, quite a bit of restriction. That's why it has so much hose on it. And it's got a part that goes down in there and shoots CO2. So you purge the bottle of CO2, but you don't actually build up the pressure. You open it up. It goes all the way to the bottom. It fills from the bottom and the reason it works well is because you've purged it and also because it's filling, 
you know, fairly slowly from the bottom. So you don't get a lot of foam with that either. You may get a little foam at the top, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Cause then, you know, you're full CO2 when you cap it. So they both, both work good. The beer gun tends to work a little faster. If you were going to do real, you know, long-term storage of bottles, the counter pressure bottle filler would probably be a better way to go. If you're going to, if you just want to bottle some beer and get it over so people can drink it, the beer guns, you know, uh, is a great way to go. So correct me if I'm wrong. And I might be talking out of my butt, which we're all familiar with. I would argue that the beer gun is more convenient because it's more portable. Like I, like it, it, it almost seems like you'd want a station set up if you're using a, a true counter pressure bottle, like to mount it and have it as a mm, station. No. You don't think so? No, I mean, it's, I've never seen anybody mount one. Oh, I have. I'll send you. I'll send you photos after this. I think there's a whole thread. Of- uh, go ahead and talk to James, and I'll grab one. Okay, yeah, go for <laughs> it. You go. You go for it, James. You're. You're. I mean, obviously, we're huge fans of Blickman products. Have you used sure. the counter pressure before, or do you have you always just used the beer gun? Um, I've. I've never used. We did a counter pressure bottle filler years ago for a six pack for Todd for a party, and the ones I entered into the national homebrew competition. That was the last time. And that, I think that was 2017. That was the last time we used it. And it was an actual counter pressure, like what Todd's holding up. Yeah. Oh, and it was really easy to use. Wait, so have you um, never used the beer gun? Never have. No way. I had no idea. Okay. I just, uh, oh, and to- okay. Todd's on screen. Okay. So, you know, here's a counter pressure bottle filler. So that's what I'm talking about. See this tube here? That's where the uh, CO2 comes out of. Here's where the beer comes out of. And, you know, you've got lots of hoses on here that I don't have on here right now, but basically you, you get the pressure the same in both ways, and then you flow the beer and that's it. I mean, it's, it's super simple to use, but I don't, I mean, I'm sure you could mount this somehow, but I don't, I mean, normally I've never mounted it. I've just put it on the beer bottle and turned the valves. I know I've seen it. I'm going to, if, if I can't find it and, and show the photo in the show notes, I'm going to edit this whole part out and we're not going to have a, a choice question. I'll still give you the gift card, Troy, but cause I'm not going to look like an idiot for saying, yeah, I've seen people mount a bottle, counter pressure bottle. Filler. Well, you could mount it. I'm sure you could mount it. Oh, maybe I'm going to mount it now. If you I- you <laughs> could put two nails up and have him hold it like that. This is the only time go. in the show I wish I had that product at my house because I would absolutely <laughs> go mount it real quick. See, because it. it won't work if you just use one. How, you got to have how two. Dare you? How dare you? How dare you? I, <laughs> that reminds me, I almost chuckled whenever, whenever Mike's uh, feedback was said or oh, something about your orifice. I almost chuckled. But anyway, um, yeah. The, so, okay. So then let's wrap up Troy's question. Do do you have a preference? Is is the counter pressure the the best bet for lawn storage, like you said, or or does it not really? At the end of the day, is the beer gun adequate enough and not true, even though it's not truly counter pressure bottle filling? Mm, I have never done an experiment or anything, so uh, I I mean I could definitely see that with a counter pressure where you're uh, you know you're purging all the original air out and you're basically get him at the same pressure. I mean, you, at some point you're still releasing everything and you have to put, and you have to cap it. So I don't know. I think if you do it right with a beer gun, it'll be fine. I've, I've done a lot with a beer gun. So, and then James, for the specifics mm-hmm. of his question, you know, the tap cooler one, uh, and there'll be a link to the show notes, guys. Uh, the tap cooler one goes directly on a faucet, assuming it's universal, works with any spout. Because uh, I could see some issues with it, maybe not working with every spout, because there are differences between manufacturers and their and, mm-hmm. the, and the diameters of spout. Uh, d- do you think that that would introduce any issues going right off the spout, or I, I can't think I, of any off the top of my head. I can't think of any anything either, other than I wouldn't. I really don't want a bottle, so. <laughs> I love it. You're like, why? <laughs> like, like, like Troy asked the question, like, why, why bottle? Just, just give them yeah, a growl. Yeah, I understand. You know, they do that to like bring their uh, friends beer and, and that makes sense. Um, yeah, I just, I just love it though. You're like, nope, not bottling. Not gonna be- <laughs> I see. I could have sworn you used the, the beer gun and look, you're like, nope. Why would I bottle? It was 2017 and it was for a competition. <laughs> and that was the competition where they said that you had uh, some infection in it. You're like, the, the beer bottle was there for three days. No, I don't. And we were drinking out of the keg. Like, no, you didn't. There's no infection. They got the wrong bottle. They wrote, they wrote <laughs> yeah, feedback. Well. <laughs> they, they had to have written feedback for the wrong beer. No, I'm still convinced of that because we were drinking off your keg for 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 wheats after that y'all's beer doesn't yeah. last that long but it was at uh, least wheats 
anyway. Who knows? Yeah, anyway. But- I mean, I, the, the only thing about I mean, the tap cooler, the con- I'm looking at the counter pressure bottle filler. I mean, I don't necessarily see a huge advantage to it because with with a beer gun or the counter pressure bottle filler, the, the other one that we sell, all you're doing is just hooking into your corny keg. So the only time I could see an advantage of using this maybe if you were doing a com- maybe with a commercial beer but even oh. with a commercial beer you can hook into the sanky tap i just yeah. don't i don't know i mean i i would prefer the other two to that tap cooler well i was thinking, i was so. thinking that too i'd feel safer about the transfer if i just had cuz like the beer gun it has that, like you said, that long tubing with the a ball locked or pin locked disconnect right to the keg. Then my gas, you know, connects right to it as well. And and doing it all direct from the source, I prefer just because it eliminates a factor. But uh, but total preface or or for transparency's sake, I'd have no experience with the tap curler one. It seems cool, but and there's a lot of things in the in the homebrewing world that just I'm like, eh, okay, whatever. It's like duo tight right now, guys. I still can't wrap my head around like the the duo tight craze. I don't get it. Yeah. Yeah, John Gaston has uh, been around forever. I just yeah, don't I'm, get it. I'm, I'm not a. I mean, I'm not a fan of that either. But a lot of people like oh, it. They, I just. I know they love it, and I just don't get it. I'm not do- dogging it. Duo tie the great uh, Kedlin, I think, is the one who made it. You are doing good stuff, I'm sure. I just don't get it. My brain. Well, it's, I mean, it's just like a John Gist. I mean, it is highly used in Europe at one time, and it's somewhat fallen out of favor now. I mean, you, you don't see it near as much as you used to in Europe, James. Um, yeah. But at one time it was, it was very, uh, it was very big there. It never really caught on in the United States. It's just, it's pretty much the same thing. I I just, I don't know. I just just brought it up because it's one of those things that I like it, it, like with the sour beers or hazies, it's just something in our realm that a lot of people love and they tell me the good things about it. And I'm just like, I don't get it. Uh, Not dogging you. Enjoy what you enjoy, whatever. I don't get it. But with the, with the tap cooler one, uh, Troy, uh, you know, if you already have a, a counter pressure bottle filler, we don't see a benefit to getting another one unless no. your situation require like would be super difficult to, you know, get to your source, which is your keg. Uh, we just don't see a benefit of spending the extra money for something that goes off your tap. But as James always says, whatever works for you, man, whatever works for you, just keep doing that. So thank Definitely. you, Troy, so much for submitting your question. Moving on to question number three came from our buddy, William, who used the submission form at homebrewhappyhour.com. William wrote, I was given an old jockey box with which came with a plate chiller. I've never used one, but I have heard that they are notoriously difficult to clean. This entire setup is probably 10 plus years old. Should I keep the rest and ditch the chiller? What's the best way to thoroughly clean a jockey box plate chiller? Dude, I would get, I would replace the, the liquid lines first of a 10 year old kit. Uh, Todd might correct me. You might you, you might argue you could get it clean, but I have also heard guys that that plate chillers are stupid hard to clean. What are y'all's thoughts on William's question? So a plate chiller, uh, just so everybody understands what it is, it's basically a block of aluminum, and inside the block of I've actually been where they make them before and watched them make them. They they take let's say ten feet of stainless steel and it coils around inside of there and a lot of them have more than one port so they'll have multiple uh, ones that go all the all the way around at, at various lengths depending on what type of chiller it is and what it's for and and then it it goes in this giant it's on this giant block of aluminum and you and you cool the block of aluminum and then that cools the lines inside and that cools the beer so uh w- what you've got are you've got all these lines that are inside and there's no, really no way to get to them other than with liquid. So if you got one that's 10 years old and it was cleaned properly when it was put away, then it's absolutely, it's probably absolutely fine. If you've got one that wasn't cleaned properly, then you're probably going to want to set up some sort of a circulation system and, and get some really good, like so we, we sell brew clean, which is a, which is a great cleaner. Uh, you could use that and, and maybe circulate it with really, hot water as hot as you can get it. And I would circulate it for a while, if, especially if you had a pump or something where you could, or get liquid in there and, and stop it in there so that it stays in there for a while. And m- maybe do that several times and then even finish it off with maybe an acid type cleaner. Um, I mean, you, you just don't know what's in there. That The, the, the thing about a, a plate chiller or even a 
even a coil chiller is, is somewhat the same way. Cause it, you know, it's got a hundred feet of line, either one of them, it, it, they work. It's nice to know you were the last one that used it because you know what, what was done with it. You know, it, it's, it could be hard to clean. It's, and, and it's no different with our brow tag. We've got the, uh, we have the much larger size coil, but, uh, we've got a coil in there that it's the same thing. You want to make sure you clean it real good before you put it away. So James, true or false? Cause I thought I've heard this before that plate chillers can harbor bacteria easier. So like, you know, you might think you have everything, all the particulates out of it, but there still could be stuff lurking. Well, whenever I, I, Rick, when I first started all grain brewing with that big system, we used a Blinkman, uh, plate chiller and man, that thing was efficient, but if you ever got any hops or anything through it, it was really hard to flush out, but you have to back flush them. So what I ended up doing just to be on the safe side is the, the, the morning we started grinding grains, I had this great big, huge stock pot. I'd fill up with water and uh, have it boiling all day long with the chiller in it. And I'd put the lid on it and uh, just get oh, a nice smart. rolling boil and let it steam sanitize all day long. And that seemed to help. We never had any uh, bacteria issues, but absolutely. If you don't clean it well and you get hop residue in it, it's it, there's no way to scrub the plates because they're all welded together. Yeah, you may yeah, have- that, That's a good point, James, because you got two issues. You've got one that you just may have crud in there and the yeah. other issues you might have bacteria. But if you do what you're doing and you boil it, you're going to kill everything. So the worst you could do is just get some crud that comes out of it, but it'll be right. dead crud. It'll, it'll be so. sanitized crud. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we at, Right before we went to use it, we would also, I would flush it uh, one more time and put it back in the water just to if back flush it. Don't, don't right. go through right. the normal flow. Go right. backwards through it. So if there's anything in there dislodged, it'll go out the inlet. Yeah. And you can use sanitizer in one as well, but the problem with that is how do you get it all out? You know, you got to make sure you flush it really well. That's what I was going to yeah. ask, but you answered the question. And Todd, you made a good point too. I assume because my experience with Jockey Bots is, uh, is like the commercial setting where they're just used all the time from these craft breweries that are doing shows or craft beer festivals every weekend. And the condition those are in are usually gross. But you're right. If someone, if someone, a home brewer uses it maybe once or twice a year and they clean it out real good and they put it on the shelf, there's, there's probably going to be nothing wrong with, with the components inside of it. So my, or, or a craft brewer that uses it every day, as long as they clean it properly each time then it'll be, it should be fine. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I just, yeah. You're a good point. And even excessive use, as long as it's clean, I mean, that's the, the end point is as long as it's clean it's usable and you don't need to worry about replacing components but the plate uh, like to, to wrap up your question william i don't think the plate needs to be ditched at all as long as you do what like todd and james are talking about in regards to uh keeping things hygienic you can't be too hygienic as a brewer i've yeah learned. and the others so we, we kind of talked about three different things and they're you know, there's, there's a level of uh, importance to all three of them. So if you're using the coil in your brewing system and it's basically heating up your water uh, with the other one, then you've got a couple of things going for you. One, it's heating up the water. So it gets pretty hot. And then two, I mean, James, I won't mention any names, but I've used our group brewing system before where somebody forgot to clean it and I've opened the valve and it shot out stuff that smelled like like vomit, vomit right yeah yeah, yeah. that and sugar the bacteria builds pressure and because what it did is, is it basically fermented inside of there mm-hmm. so that's exactly right uh so that you know that's that's pretty nasty but really i mean if you flush that out right then and you run the hot water through it and it's circulating and and you brew your beer and you boil your beer for an hour and all of that it's it's really not going to cause any problem but or, or if you're serving a beer and, and it's going through those coils and it's going straight into the glass. It's not, the beer's not going to go bad before you put it, before you drink it. Right. But, you know, chiller is a really different thing depending on how the, how the chiller works. Cause you're cooling the beer down to the point where it will have issues that there's bacteria. My favorite, mm-hmm. this is, you know, I'm kind of digressing, but that jockey bots uh, y'all built for our homebrew con. Uh, I forget which year it was. I think it was the last year they had it in person. Uh, that's my yeah, favorite no. ever. I mean, that V10 faucets on it. And we were, we were drafting off four. I had made digital signage for the front. 
that we gotta do that again. That I can't go back to normal jockey boxes anymore. I don't have a reason to use a jockey box, but I want one now after we had done that. Um, man, yeah. jockey, they, they could be fun. And we've had issues in the past with using those plate chillers in a warm keg of beer. Yeah, you know it. It uh, it's hard to keep from foaming. You it know? is. It is. Yeah. Jo- it, it is jo- a mobile setup. Foaming is such a prevalent thing if you don't have good temperature control. Or in in that case, it's like, oh, maybe I should keep my beer in a thing of ice plus the the jockey box coil full of ice just to cover my bases and make sure that I'm getting the best yeah. chance possible for this beer to not come out just total foam. But anyways, William, thank you so much for submitting your question. Our last question of this week was a text message from our buddy Pete O at 325-305-6107. Pete wrote, new brewer here wondering if the Krausen means it's still fermenting. Does it go away when the beer is ready? Do I stick my transfer tube through the Krausen? This question made me first think, guys, am I been saying that word wrong? Because I, I think I've heard people call it Krausen, Krausen, like Trube, Trube and Krausen. I, I've always said Trub and Krausen. Are we doing that wrong, too? I, I say Krausen. I mean, I say Krausen. OK, unless it's a sour beer, then I say sour Krausen. Oh, no. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I'm editing that out. Uh, <laughs> Pete, Pete's question. I've oh my. I always get to the beer guys after the Krausen has lowered, and I you know there's obviously evidence of the high Krausen, but for the most part it lowers. I guess in theory, if you take a reading and your numbers are there, then it doesn't matter, right? Right. So I mean, have you transferred through? Have you ever had issues using like an auto siphon or whatever for transferring and gotten Krausen with the transfer? I just don't see that there would be an issue. It's not a big deal. Just punch through it and and siphon your beer. The most important thing I think is just make sure that you, it's at the gra- final gravity. You know, I don't really, and I don't one hundred percent understand the question. I mean, I if if I'm down to one point. Oh, one, oh, or whatever. I'm not, it's not like I'm seeing a bunch of crowds in that's, there. It's, yeah, it's, I agree. it's down all the way. Well, well, I, I haven't run into that before. Well, so. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. I, I haven't either. Is it possible though, for it to be at your final gravity and still have high, I mean, high crowds is like the, the, the midpoint of, no, no, I right? don't think so. Like it's not possible, yeah. right? I say not. No. Possible. It'll Someone's, dissipate. It would, it should yeah. dissipate by the time it's final. I mean, you're, you're not, you're not going to be done and open up right. the fermenter and have that much crowds and you know coming out of the top of the of the uh of the fermenter if it's done i mean if it's done it's it's not going to be bubbling that much it's not going to have that much of that foam in there because the foam dissipates as soon as it as as soon as you start to you know get to gravity so, right. Well, and I mean, this, get, to, get to where you get, need to be. Right. Your, your numbers, your final gravity. This might be one of those examples of like how time, Pete, and, and like patience and time is a beard's best friend. You, you're anxious to tr- drink it, but there's a good chance if there's if there's thick Krausen still on top that that bad boy is still ferment and you don't want to you don't want to stop fermentation unless you are at your numbers and you don't want it to be too dry that's but but again that's probably not what's going on here what's going on here is it's probably been four three or four days and fermentation is still very active but he's wanting to transfer the beer would y'all agree right yeah yeah i mean i'd have to know what his numbers were to 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 say for sure but i i suspect if he still had what what we call high crowds, and then his numbers are nowhere, it's probably still in the twenties. So right, so just yeah, and, f- and still needs more more time to firm it out. Right. I mean, and, I don't think they're at ten. You know, so yeah. And I was also trying to just get us to say the word crowds in as much because if we are saying it wrong, we're gonna get some great feedback for next week's episode. We're like, ah, oh, could not stand the last five minutes of your <laughs> show. Uh, no, Pete, I, I think we're all in agreement here. It's a short and sweet answer, but let it fall. Uh, it shouldn't be thick like like what we call a high crowds, and or there might be some on top, but ultimately what matters is your numbers are there. We're just not confident that your numbers are there if there's a thick amount of crowds and still present. It's just not... I'm not going to say it's impossible because then we will get feedback like, well, actually, Josh, the impossible it happens because of this. <laughs> and da, da, da. But uh, I would love to actually hear in the comments if someone has a different answer than us. If someone goes, no, Pete, transfer away. Who cares? I've just never experienced it. Maybe it's just Imperial. When I That's the only yeast I've been using for the last few years. 
finishes so quick. I don't I, when I, by the time I check it on day three or day four, it is is done, and, and the crowds and the remnants are there of high crowds, but it's not on top of the beer anymore. So I've never had experience with well, my numbers are there, but I'm going to pierce through this and transfer. So I just can't <laughs> relate, Pete. But guys. That's it for this week, man. That's that's all I have. Uh, another reminder before we wrap up, if you send us a voicemail, which I'm desperately needing right now because I accidentally wiped our server of voicemail, so I've got like two now. Uh, we do give you a $25 gift card to KetConnection.com, or you can leave a text or an email, and we'll give you a $15 gift card. But that's 325-305-6107. Todd, James, thank you all so much for taking time out of your busy day. I hope you all don't have fun next week at all without me. It's going to be <laughs> miserable but i'll send y'all uh, photos of me in charge okay sounds good you thank go. you catch you later guys see ya bye-bye yeah. and that will do it for this episode of the homebrew happy hour if you have a question you'd like us to discuss on a future episode go to homebrewhappyhour.com and click on that submit a question link at the top of the page or be todd's best friend and leave us a voicemail at 325-305-6107 brew better beer with the new grandfather g40 all-in-one electric system available now at grandfather.com also get a free pack of imperial yeast along with great premium recipes from us when you join our chop club go to patreon.com forward slash homebrew happy hour and come brew with us on behalf of todd burns james carlson and the pearl media network i'm joshua student thank you for listening